Our scripture reading this evening comes from Psalm 19. We'll read from Psalm 19. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In then hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the, of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter than all than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is a great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also for, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. This father reading of the word of God. So the text this evening comes from Psalm 19, which we had the chance of singing both part A and part B of this beautiful psalm. And this will be our meditation this evening. But before we begin, let's ask for the Lord's blessing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, we stand in thy presence with thy special revelation in our hands, praying that thou would give us eyes to see, that thy spirit would apply thy word unto us, that both thy natural revelation and thy special revelation would be a witness unto us that there is a creator and that he is also our savior. So help us to come to thee, to draw closer and closer to thee, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In the last section of the Heidelberg Catechism, we saw about our triune God. And now as we continue with the words of the Apostles' Creed, we'll zoom in to talk about God as our creator, that he is our creator. Question 26 of the Heidelberg Catechism says that God as our creator will provide me with all things necessary for soul and body. Soul and body. And the Heidelberg Catechism doesn't have a specific section for the doctrine of scripture, but it clearly implies many times, and I think this is one of them. But one place in which we see both the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of scripture beautifully connected is Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, these two topics are beautifully joined together to speak of one theme, as God as our creator and savior. So we see a move in this psalm, in the language used by David. In the first part of the psalm, there is this general revelation of God, and David refers to God by his gener to his general name, God or Elohim, as we'll see. Then in the second part, when David speaks of God's special revelation, he calls him by his covenant name, Lord, Yahweh. And then finally, in the third part of the psalm, there is a shift of person taking place 
And David not only calls God in the third person, but now directly prays to him, directs his, his words to God. And this is exactly the division that will follow, the division of the psalm. Divide our text in three points. First, dominion displayed in verses 1 to 6. Second, perfection pronounced in verses 7 to 10. And then third, revelation responded in verses 11 to 14. So our creator who provides for both soul and body. So dominion display. The psalm begins with speaking of the very purpose of creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's the very purpose of creation. But now, what is the glory of God? What is God's glory that is being pronounced? Well, the basic meaning of the word glory is something that is heavy or weighty. Something weighty, heavy, the weight of God. But only in, in rare occasion, Scripture uses this word in the literal sense of weight. Most common use is to refer to a, a weighty person or a weighty person in the society, someone who is honorable in society, someone who is impressive and worthy of respect. You see, many think of God's glory as a, a light shining, as a, a mystical aura around God, and that's His glory. But that's not how Scripture refers to His glory. Here in this case, his, his works, his assets are described as his glory. His handiwork, the firmament show his handiwork. The things he makes, creation is made by God and becomes a display of his glory. The things he makes becomes a display of his glory. A showcase of his splendor, telling us of his glory, telling us of how great he is. The heavens and the firmaments are being personified here in verse 1. They cannot contain themselves and they have to proclaim the glory of God. They cannot contain themselves, so they enumerate. That's the word for declare here. They enumerate the glory of God. They enunciate the glory of God. And this is not a, a one-time thing. No, this is something that they do over and over. The heavens and the firmament keep on announcing the glory of God. Keep on proclaiming His glory. As it becomes clear in verse 2. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night shows knowledge. So it's a, it's a daily proclamation of the glory of God. Day after day the glory of God is proclaimed, is being announced through creation, through the works of His hands. This glory of God is, is too much. And creation cannot contain itself but to proclaim. That's the word here for they utter speech or they pour out. It's the image of something overflowing or, or bubbling up. See, the glory of God is too much for creation to hold in. So they have to proclaim. They have to announce. It's a secret too great for them to hold. So they Proclaim, they announce to others, behold the glory, behold the majesty of the Creator. Do you know when someone tells you a secret, and perhaps it's something that is too good, it's, a, it's good news, it's something that is very good, and sometimes it's, it's hard to keep inside. You feel like you, you need to tell others of the good news that you just received. It's too good for you to hold inside. That's the same image here. You simply cannot contain the joy you must tell others. That's what is happening here with creation. It's, it's bubbling up. It's pouring out. It's too good. They need to tell others. They need to proclaim, to enunciate to everyone. Behold the glory of God. It's too good. They need to announce it. So creation wants to tell us of their maker. To proclaim to us of their making. As if the heavens were crying out aloud. Behold how big and majestic is your God. Behold how majestic, how splendorous is the creator of the universe. They are inviting everyone to contemplate his glory with them. And it's interesting that 
although his speech is coming out, there is a message that is coming across, it's not with audible words. Verse 3, there is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. So here is what is unique about this kind of proclamation, is that it is a silent, a silent announcement. We have this picture of creation uttering or bursting out to announce to others the majesty of God, but it is a silent proclamation. There is no language. There is no words. It's a proclamation without words. However, verse 4 makes it a little confusing for us. How is it that in verse 3 it says that there is no speech, no words? But then now it says that the words in verse 4 are going to the end of the world. Verse 4, their line is gone out through the, all the earth and their words to the end of the world. The word for words here can be translated as their announcements go out to the ends of the world. But even if the, David uses two different words, there is an intentional contrast here. The, authors, the author wants us to see how although creation doesn't use any language or words, the message is clear. Creation doesn't need words to bring across the message, to bring across what they want to tell us, to teach us. And they announce it to all the world, even without a voice, even if it appears quiet, the message that is communicated is loud and clear. Behold the glory of the Creator. That's the message they tell everyone. Sometimes image, images speaks louder than words, isn't it? You don't always need words to communicate something. Perhaps every, every parent has some of these with their children, right? You don't need to say something. Or perhaps you're doing something. You don't always need to say something, to call something. But you, you just need to look to them. Your eyes cross and immediately you know what they're telling you. You know what they're saying. If you're doing something wrong, you know what that look means. You better behave now, right? You know immediately. You don't need words. Just a look. Just a look. When your eyes cross, you know immediately what they're telling you. So there is no speech, but the message is very clear. The message that is coming across is very clear. No, that is the same communication that creation is doing here. It is a silent communication. It's a non-verbal communication, but the message is clear. The message is crystal clear. It's a, a revelation that is made without words. So it doesn't matter if you don't know Hebrew or Greek or English or Portuguese. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know these languages to understand the message. You don't need to know any particular language to understand their message. Behold the glory of the Creator. That's the message. And then he gives an example. He gives an example of this silent communication. An illustration of what he means when he says that creation announces the glory of God. He speaks of how the Son quietly announces the glory of the Creator. Second half of verse 4 to verse 6. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the Son, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Well, the picture here is that God sets a tent in heavens for the Son, in the skies for the sun to stay overnight. And then each morning, the sun is like a bridegroom who comes out of his marriage chamber with a big smile on his face, announcing how good that is. Just shedding light to the ends of the world, bursting out with joy. And then he goes out into the world to do his work, to do what he has to do. And his work is then to, to run his circuits in the heavens with power so that his heat comes to the ends of the world. Something glorious 
something powerful that happens, and yet it happens every day. It's silent. It goes sometimes unnoticed. It happens every day, day after day. The sun does this. So powerful, and yet quiet. See, God didn't create a boring, flat, dull universe. No. Creation is exciting. Creation is exciting. The creation is in, is in place as a witness of God, to witness the glory and the splendor of God. And as such, creation is exciting. The sun here is as a bridegroom filled with happiness and joy, announcing the glory of the Creator. God didn't create a, a gray, flat world, boring. No, it's exciting, it's powerful, and it's beautiful. So the sun was seen as a, a deity, as a deity in many ancient religions. But here, it's just a mere agent of God's creation. The sun is not a deity, it's just an agent, it's just a creature that proclaims the glory of the Creator. Many cultures worship the sun, the God's sun. The Egyptians had Ra, the Greeks had Apollo, the Incas, the Persians, and many others had a, a sun god. But here the psalmist is saying that the sun is no god. He's not worshipped, but he is a worshipper of the true God. It's just a mere creature giving to us a glimpse of the glory of the Creator, a glimpse of who He is. There's more to know about God, as we'll see after. But what creation says is true. It tells us that there is an awesome, almighty, well-knowing God. That's the message that creation tells us. There's more to know, as we'll see, but nevertheless, what creation proclaims is true. It's a faithful revelation that there is an awesome, almighty, well-knowing God. Perhaps you have heard the famous quotation by Jonathan Edwards as he talks about spiders. He's astonished as how they build their webs. It's not a boring exercise for the spider, but even this tiny creature displays excitement. Even a tiny spider displays excitement. Excitement. So Edwards, Edwards writes, We hence see the exuberant goodness of the Creator, who hath not only provided for all necessities, but also for the pleasure and recreation of all sorts of creatures, and even the insects, and those that are most despicable. So Edwards admires the complexity, the precision, the strength of the web of the spider, and he mentions all that in detail. But isn't it amazing that creation not only works, but it's also beautiful? Have you ever thought about that, how Edwards did? That creation not only works and it is powerful, but it's at the same time beautiful. It's a splendor. It's majestic. It tells us something. Of the Creator. It announces us with excitement of who the Creator is. Creation proclaims and announces the glory of the Creator. And although that is done with a quiet voice, we would be a foolish not to hear it. If creation overflows to announce of the glory of God, of the glory of the Creator, and although that is done with a quiet voice, but it, they do it day after day. Creation does this day after day. Then how much more should we announce it? We who, who were not only created, but re recreated for the glory of God. Then how much more should we announce the glory of God? How much more excitement should we have to announce the glory of God? If God not only created us, but He created us. For his glory. You see, the same excitement should fill us to proclaim, to announce of his glory. But there is more to his revelation. He not only gave us his natural revelation through the creation, but also his, his special revelation through his word. The perfection pronounced in verses 7 to 10. 
And there is an important change here in the psalm. David was speaking of God in his natural revelation, his general revelation, but now he's referring to God in a special way. So now not only he calls him Elohim, God, but now he refers to him as the covenant-keeping Lord, Yahweh. You can notice all the capital letters now in your Bible. Now he is referring to the covenant-keeping God, to the way that God reveals himself to his people in a special way. It's going to be a list here. If it is just going to enumerate to us to list a sequence of characteristics of what the word of God is. And then we'll look through them. There's a, a parallelism in these verses. So each verse begins in a similar way. The law of God, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. See, David is just enumerating all these attributes of the Word of God, how wonderful, how complete, how perfect the Word of God is. And the first one is, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. One important thing is that when he speaks of the law of God here, he's not referring just to the Ten Commandments. He's referring here to the whole word of God, to the whole counsel of his revelation. This, the, the Torah, is the, the corpus of his revelation is the whole word of God, his whole special revelation. And the first sentence really encapsulates the whole, the whole, all the verses. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is complete. It's complete. Well, and you could ask, well, how could it be complete? By the time David is saying this, if there was revelation given after David, so how could it be complete then? Oh, it was not complete in the canonical sense, but in the sense of meaning. The meaning is complete. The meaning is perfect. It offers exactly what you need. That is why it converts the soul. It transforms the whole man because the Word of God has exactly what we need to transform us, to restore us, to make us, to live according to what God has created us for His glory. So it turns us back to where we were supposed to be. And then the testimony of the Lord is sure. See, the Ten Commandments were called tablets of the testimony, Exodus 32, verse 15. And the ark was also referred as the ark of the testimony, Exodus 40, verse 5. So these were legal codes, legal codes or witnesses, guides for the people. It's legal guides for the people to live in accordance to this. Why do we need the guides? Well, because we are simple. And his law makes wise the simple. What does simple mean? Well, simple is someone who is guileable, someone who is naive and can be guided either for good or for bad. So we need a good guider who will actually guide us for something good. And the Word of God meets us where we are, and it guides us in the way that we need, sometimes through comfort, sometimes through exhortation, but it guides us. Have you gone bowling with someone who perhaps was learning how to do that? And you see that in the lanes of someone who is learning bowling, they will have these bumpers around the lane, right, to prevent the ball from, from falling into the gutters, right? So they will have these bumpers up. So that's the picture here, that the law of God is like these bumpers who prevents us from falling into the gutters. It's a guide. It's a guide for us to learn how to walk in the right way, to prevent us from destroying ourselves, from falling into the goddess, from harming ourselves. It's a guide. It's a guide to protect us. And then he says in verse 8, the statues of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. So you see, the, the instructions the, the, or the procedures are upright. They're not crooked. They're not crooked. They're all right. What does it cause? It causes the heart to rejoice. 
Now, that's easy enough to see. Crooked rulers and rules cause us to get mad, doesn't it? Crooked rules and rulers cause us to get mad. So he's saying that an upright law actually causes us to rejoice. And maybe you're thinking, well, it's definitely easier to get mad with crooked laws and crooked rulers. But I don't remember the last time I got rejoicing over some kind of instruction. A good law that would make me happy or instructions that would make me rejoice. Usually instructions are something cold, right? Cold and boring. Rules are cold and boring so very often. So rejoice is not the first thing, first thing that comes to our minds when we get some instructions. But that's not the case with the precepts of God. As the whole creation is not something boring and dull, His law, His word, His revelation is also not boring and dull. But it causes excitement. The Bible speaks of God's law as a delight, as a delight. Psalm 119, verse 174. O Lord, thy law is my delight. It's my delight. It's something good that causes me to delight, to find pleasure in thy law. And have you ever thought how the longest psalm is to speak about God's law? Isn't that amazing? That his law is not boring and dull, but it's a delight. Something that causes us to rejoice. This is similar to the son who comes out as a bridegroom rejoicing. We found the same kind of delight in his word. In his word. We become just as the son in verse 5 as we follow the precepts of God. And the core idea of satisfaction here, of contentment in the Lord is that you can have joy in the Lord even in times of tribulation. Even when things are hard, when the situation is tough, you can still find this joy, this delight in His Word. Even when the situation is contrary to you, when things are hard, you can find delight, pleasure in the perfect precepts of God, in His perfect law. And He also says in verse 8 that the, commandments, the commandment of the Lord is pure. His commandment or clean, with no flaw. There is no flaw in the commandment of God. They enlighten the eyes. It gives light to the eyes. The lightning to the eyes here, the core idea is that it gives hope. It's like a light to the eyes, a light in the darkness that gives hope, that gives hope. That's the same expression that we find in Ezra chapter 9, verse 8. It's a a message of encouragement in the darkness. It's a light to our eyes in the midst of the darkness that gives hope, that renews our hope. So the idea of this verse is that the word of God causes us to have hope and joy in the Lord. Even in times of darkness, we find hope and joy in His word. Then in verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever now fear doesn't seem to fit the list of synonyms here for the law right fear he suddenly speaks of fear oh this is a figure of speech the effect is substituted by the cause so the law of god causes the fear of god the revelation of god produces reverence to god so interesting that he says that the fear of God or the law of God, the word of God is clean. His word is clean, ceremonially clean. There is no impurity in God's word. You see, in the ceremonial rituals, for something to become unclean, that means that something had a mixture, would be mixed with something else. It would be a mixture, either in fa fabric or anything else. There would be something that was impure that would touch that which was pure, making then that become also impure, unclean, but not with God's law. There is no mixture in God's law. The fear of God is free from any type of contamination, and it endures forever. So that is so different from human laws, isn't it? Because human laws are at the same time filled with mixture, with contamination, 
contaminated with whatever ideology they hold, contaminated with shady political interests. So it has contamination and it changes. Human laws changes very often. They need to be updated, should be changed. Amendments need to be made, but not with God's law. You see how different God's law is from human laws. See? Because God's law endures forever and it is pure. It is clean. It lasts forever. It remains forever pure. It's no surprising then that Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9 verse 10. Because they can, it can be used for everything. It's because the word of God is so pure and endures forever that we can use it for everything. We can apply it for everything in our lives. And then the judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now the picture here now is of a court, a law court. We are standing before the court of the Lord. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are reliable and cannot be overthrown. You know, when lawyers have an appeal to make, when they disagree with something, or when they have an appeal to make, and they raise their hands and they say, objection, your honor. So that's the picture here. That that's not going to happen with God's judgments. No, and it is altogether righteous. Meaning it is unanimous. No one is going to raise their hands and say, objection, your honor. No, there is no objection before the perfect and righteous judgments of God. It is perfect. No one will raise their voice to object anything that the judge of the universe says. On the contrary, we simply, we bow our heads and we say, Amen, Lord. Amen. Let it be so, Lord, because thy judgments are all together right. There's no objection whatsoever. Now, can you see the overwhelming repetition that David gives us here? The overwhelming repetition, one after the other, trying to tell us how great the law of God is, how great His Word is, how perfect, how complete His Word is. It's nothing, nothing can compare to His Word. Just look how many times He says the name Lord, just in a few verses, six times. See, he is exemplifying time after time how great he is, how great our covenant-keeping God is, and how wonderful his word is. His word is trustworthy. His word brings delight. His word is just, and his word endures forever. Nothing can compare. And then in verse 10, it's almost a conclusion. It, it almost overflows after all that he has said. An outpouring of his heart. Verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Nothing can compare to his word. There's nothing like this. There's nothing as good, as great as his word is. There's nothing better. Aren't you impressed with his word? You like gold? Well, so here it is. What is more valuable than gold? You like honey? So here it is. What is sweeter? What is more enjoyable than honey? Don't you want something like this? Don't you want to taste? Don't you want to possess something as good as this? That's the picture. Aren't you overwhelmed with how good his word is? Aren't you impressed with how wonderful, how perfect and complete his word is? Don't you want something like this? The Ralph Davis commenting on this passage tells us of the story of William Tyndale. And it's an appropriate time of the year to remember the reformers. Dale Davis wrote about William Tyndale. The man who had given England a Bible in its own tongue had taken refuge in Antwerp. He was betrayed by a false friend and handed over to the tender mercies of the church for an eventual execution. 
For some time he was kept in prison in Vilvorn, a little no north of Brussels, where he braced himself to endure the winter months. S. M. Houghton tells us that a 19th century researcher discovered a letter of Tyndale's in Belgian archives, a letter written to the governor of the prison. It reads in part. So here now the letter that Tyndale's write as he was in prison to the governor. I entreat you, I entreat your lordship, and that by the Lord Jesus, that, I, that if I am to remain here during the winter, you will request the governor to be kind enough, enough to send me from my goods, which he has in his possession. A warm cap, for I suffer extremely from cold in the head. A warmer coat also, for that which I have is very thin. Also a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. I wish also permission to have a lamp in the evening, for it is wearisome to sit alone in the dark. But above all, I entreat and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the governor that he may kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible. To have my Bible. He wanted his Bible. He was going to face the cold winter and he was worried to have his Bible with him. To have the word of God. He wanted to complete his work of translating the Bible and he wanted to have the Bible with him as his comfort. Nothing that he wanted more than his Bible. And you see, now we have free access to the Word of God. We have free access to the Bible in our hands. This very Bible, this very book that so many gave their lives to translate it to our language. And for what? Just sit in our shelves collecting dust. So many gave their lives for us to have this Bible translated to our language, such as Tyndale gave his life for what can we say that we desire the bible that we desire the word of god as our delight as david did as tyndale did can we say that it is our meditation day and night that we find pleasure in the bible delight in his word to keep us through the winter months same god maker of heaven and earth Gave us his revelation. Not only in nature. But his very voice. His very words. In this book. So we should treasure it. And we should desire it. Above all else. So may the word of God be precious. As precious to us. As he was to David. And as he was to Tyndale. And many others. And after we have considered. God's revelation to us. Here it is, how we ought to respond, how we ought to respond back to God. So much he has given, and now here is our response. Revelation responded, verses 11 to 14. Notice that up until this point, David was speaking about the Lord in the third person. He was telling about the Lord. But now he turns directly to God, and he speaks or rather he prays to God. He, he becomes a prayer. He puts himself in the position of a, a humble servant who is praying to his God. Verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. See, warn and reward, both in scriptures, both in the word of God, even as we heard this morning. So scripture doesn't shy away from neither of these, from warn and reward, both of them in his word. The warnings of the word of God are to keep us away from evil, away from judgment. But on the other hand, those who keep his commandments, those who are servants of the Lord, then receive a great reward. From him, find great reward. And it is exactly hoping to find God's grace 
that David, the psalmist, he starts to plead before the Lord in verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Secret faults. He's not asking to be cleansed from sins that other people don't know about. Sins that I know, but maybe other people don't know, that are secret to them. No, he's asking to be cleansed from, from sins that I don't even know, know, don't know about. The sins that are not only secret to others, but are, that they are secret to me. Cleanse thou me from secret faults to me that I might not even know about. See, Lord, I am worse than what I think I am. That I, there are worse things in me that I even know I have. But cleanse me from them as well, Lord. Cleanse me from the sins that I don't even know about. That's a cry for mercy. Consider me innocent. Declare me innocent, even from sins that I didn't intend. Lord, you know better about myself than I, than I do. You know better about me than I know myself. So cleanse me from all my iniquities. And then he asked not only for forgiveness of sins he didn't intend to commit, but second, for sins that he did intend. Sins that he committed willfully. So he committed in arrogance, in pride. Verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. That is in arrogance. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall I be innocent from great transgression. Let them not have dominion or rule over me. Sin enslaves us. Sin is like a, a master that enslaves us, that keeps us in bondage. The psalmist knows, the psalmist knows very well that sin will keep you in bondage. Every sin has this enslaving effect. It's capable of holding you slave to sin, dominating over, having dominion over you. Do not underestimate sin. Any type of sin, any kind of sin, do not underestimate sin. The psalmist knows, the psalmist knows both his nature, how filled with flaws he is, and how serious sin is. So when you put both together, do not underestimate sin. And if the Lord grants you this, you'll be free from great transgression. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. It is only if God holds us back. It's only if God preserves us, keeps us away from sinning, keeps us away from transgression, protects us that we will be able to stand. It's only God's sustaining power that prevents us from apostasy. It's only by God's grace and God's power that prevents us from committing the most terrible sins from apostatizing from our faith. Otherwise, there would be no sin we would not commit. There would be no sin we would not commit. The famous saying, there but for the grace of God go I. That is true. There is no sin we would not commit apart from the grace of God. God is the one who keeps us from apostasy. So don't look down to others. Don't look down to others thinking that you are so much better than they. Because it is just for the, but for the grace of God that you are not doing the same thing. It's but for the grace of God. But on the other hand, if you are struggling, pray to Him. Let them not have dominion over me. What a wonderful prayer this is. Let them not have dominion over me. Lord, the same God who has created the universe, who has created all things, has also the power to break me free from the bondage of sin, 
to rescue me from the bondage of sin. So, Lord, let them not have dominion over me. Lord, help me to break free from the bondage of sin. I don't want to live a life under the dominion of sin. And finally, David closes with a, a positive request, not only to be kept away from sins that grieves the Lord, but to be pleasing in the sight of God. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be a set bow in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Words so very often can be used for evil. See, we can use words to harm other people, to cause evil, to cause division, to cause harm to other people, to deceive other people. So he pleads, he pleads before God, let my words be acceptable to thee. Let what comes out of my mouth be for edification, not for destruction. Let what comes out of my mouth be acceptable before thee. Let them be acceptable. Let them be pleasing to thee. Just as the sacrifices were acceptable before God, were pleasing to God, let my words be a living sacrifice to thee, Lord. Let them be pleasing to thee. Let our lives be a living sacrifice to thee. My Redeemer. My Redeemer. We think of redeeming as buying back, right? Redeeming something is buying something back, and that is true. But the word here for Redeemer has the idea of a restorer, refers to a family member, a relative who would make things right when another family member is in need. It's the same word we find in the book of Ruth. As Boaz, Boaz becomes the, the one who redeems Ruth. He becomes the redeemer who redeems Ruth. So because of the family relationship, there are obligations. He has the obligation to avenge, to rescue the one who is in need. Now the psalmist here is calling God our redeemer. Not just because he bought us back with the blood of his son, but that he is the one who does what needs to be done with those who are in a relationship to him, related to him by way of the covenant. So because of his covenant loyalty, by virtue of his relationship with him, because of a covenant loyalty, now he becomes the redeemer who has to rescue us. So as we profess God to be our Father, we confess that we are His sons and daughters, and we are putting God in the family, and say that because of His covenant loyalty, because of His covenantal loyalty, He redeems us. Not because we deserve, not because of what we do, but because of his faithfulness to the covenant, because of his faithfulness, we plead to him on the basis of the covenant, be the redeemer thou hast promised to be and rescue us. Be my redeemer, O Lord. Be my redeemer. So now we can pray, my redeemer, do duty to me. I am in need. Do duty to me and rescue me. Redeem me. I worship before the Lord, even our prayers, are only acceptable to Him because He redeemed us through His Son, through Jesus Christ. He redeems us. And now our pleas before our words become acceptable before Him. See, it is a good thing to have God as our Creator. Everyone has. All the world has God as their Creator. But it is even a better thing that we can say that He is not only our Creator, but also our Redeemer. That our Creator is also our Savior. 
the same one who created us, also recreated us and became our Savior. That's even better. We can say that the maker of heaven and earth is also the one who gave his only begotten Son to redeem me, to redeem us, to make me part of his family, to adopt me into his family. And he provided for me. He provided for me all things necessary, both on body and soul, as our catechism says. Through his creation and through his word, he has provided for me all that I need, both in the body and in the soul. So that now, now, as I have God as my creator and as I have God as my redeemer, now I can live for the purpose for which I was created, to live for the glory of God, to live for his glory. So as we go out, and as we contemplate all that God has created, let that also be a reminder for us, a reminder, a living reminder that He has to be my Redeemer as well. Let us be astonished. Let us be astonished with creation of how great Thou art, O Lord. Let the heavens be a proclamation of His glory to us and a proclamation that my Creator must be my Redeemer. That there is only one who could be salvation to me. As the hymn says, O Lord my God, when I am in awesome wonder, just like creation is in awesome wonder, consider all the works Thy hands hath made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then, then sings my soul, my Savior God, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. You see, my Creator is also my Redeemer, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Let his revelation, his general revelation through creation and his special revelation through his word be a proclamation to us that my creator must be my savior. Lord, how great thou art. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how great thou art. We are overwhelmed with thy glory both displayed in creation, but especially thy glory and beauty displayed in thy word. That the way of redemption has been provided through Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son who came into the world to die for my sins, for the sins of his people. Oh Lord, we pray that our creator would also be our redeemer that our maker, the maker of heaven and earth, would also be our Father, which art in heaven. That is our prayer today. And we pray, Lord, never, ever let thy revelation in our, in our lives become boring and dull. Help us to forever be impressed with thy revelation forever and ever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.